Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you again. We want to always remind you how you can reach us so that if you want to study God's Word or have Bible study with us, here's how you can reach me, A Word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276 2653 And we meet at 250 the Boulevard in Eden. We hope that you will come out and visit with us when you have the chance or make the opportunity. We've been uh, doing a little door knocking the past couple of days and uh, meeting some folks that... Uh, uh, have known about us but have not come to visit us. And as a matter of fact, some of them say, well, they used to watch us on TV. When you say, well, why, aren't you, why are you not watching any longer? And well, we've got DISH. And so uh, if you know folks that have DISH network and aren't getting the TV program, you need to tell them to come down to the Boulevard so, and study God's Word with us. And if you are uh, really inclined, if you are somebody, if you know somebody's got DISH, you might tell them they need to call DISH Network and tell them to get WGSR or <clears throat> something like something else, some, some other way you can reach us because we are the individuals in your community that care enough about you to give you the Word of God free of charge. We never ask for any money, so we hope that you will uh, really uh, stop and reconsider how good of a friend we're really trying to be to you and by giving you the gospel and uh, bringing it to you in this format or all the very for various formats that we uh, have to offer. So if you have like a copy of any TV programs, we would certainly give those out to you free of charge. And if you have a Bible question, you know you can ask us the Bible questions. Sometimes you're afraid to ask your, your preacher, and I would be too because some of the preachers don't know, really know how to answer questions. They don't know what the Bible is really saying. They don't really know how to give you a word from the Lord. And so what they'll give you is they'll give you their thoughts or their ideas or their what they learned in seminary, but they won't give you the Bible, and that's what we're trying to give you. So we hope that you will take advantage of that. As a matter of fact, when we're talking about asking questions and talking to people about the gospel, I'm going to encourage you to listen carefully to what people say and because what, what it'll do, it'll tell you really kind of what's in their heart. It'll tell you what they believe. And uh, like we said a couple weeks ago, it's not so much uh, what they say, but also listen to what they don't say. And uh, really there's, a, there's an art to listening to individuals to know really what is being said. Now, a couple weeks ago I did a lesson called a, a denomination conversation, and some individuals called, got a, got a few calls or comments from it that uh, really helped them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to continue that conversation tonight. But let me give you an example about why it's important to listen to what people say. Listen, in 2 Kings chapter 20, 2 Kings chapter 20 uh, and verse 31, we have an account of a, uh, a meeting between King Ahab, that's the, uh, the king of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, and he was battling, Israel was battling the Syrians. And the Syrian king was named Ben-Hadad. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> Ben-Hadad, excuse me, Ben-Hadad uh, uh, fled, and he knew that he was about to be captured. And listen to what, he, this is what the text says, verse 30. First, uh, 2 Kings 20 and verse 30. And uh, the rest fled to Aphek into the city, and there a wall fell upon 20 and 7,000 of the men that were there. And Ben Hadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. Verse 31, And his servants said unto him, Behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our head and go out to the king of Israel. Peradventure he will save thy life. And so they girded sackcloth on their, on their loins and put ropes on their heads <clears throat> and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Ben-Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he said, Is he yet alive? He is my brother. Now notice verse 33. Uh, and the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him. And, he did, ha and, and did hastily catch it. And they said, Thy brother Ben-Hadad. Then he said, Go ye, bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came forth to him and caused him to come up into the chair. Now, King Ahab's going to get in trouble because he was supposed to kill Ben-Hadad, let him go. But, but notice, he called him his brother. 
And the, and the servants of Ben-Hadad, they called on this. and said, hey, he, he called him brother. Boy, that means, that means he's not really an enemy. That means he's really, you know, he's going to be nice to him. So they diligently called it. They, they listened carefully to see if anything would come from him. And what they heard from him uh, caused them to respond a certain way. Well, friends, that's really what I, I want to help you to do. When you are uh, talking to someone about the scripture, when you're talking to someone about the Bible, what I really want to encourage you to do is listen carefully to what they say. And that will help you know how to respond. Because oftentimes what they say is going to give you an opening to help to, to present the Bible to them or help them to realize that what they're saying or what they're doing is contrary to the Bible. So you need to be like the, the servants of Ben Hadad. Listen carefully to what is uh, uh, what, what comes from them so you know how to say. Now, as I mentioned, a couple weeks ago we, we did a a lesson called a denomination conversation, and it was with Mr. Craig Bowman of the uh, First Baptist Church in Eden. And it was a conversation between Mark McMinnis and, and Craig Bowman. And there's a lot of really, really valuable information and learning lessons in what was being said there. Mark was doing a good job of, of, of uh, putting uh, Mr. Bowman kind of on the, on the rope, so to speak. But there's a lot of things that Mr. Bowman said that I believe will be good learning lessons for you and me if we can just listen carefully to what he says. So let's continue on this conversation, uh, this denomination conversation, and we're going we're gonna to pick up about where we left off uh, last week. So this is about the middle of the conversation <clears throat> that uh, they had. And uh, in this, uh, in, at this particular point, uh, they've been talking about uh, the, the salvation water, uh, born, born of the water and born of the spirit. And this is, and so Mark is going to make a comment and then listen to what Mr. Bowman says. Sorry about that. And all that stems back to a wrong understanding of the scripture. Okay, and that's what I'm saying. You have a wrong understanding of what the water is. Now we've been, I'm not responsible to you. I'm responsible to Jesus. I agree. Now, am I getting that in there, Matt? Is that audio coming through? I can hear it, but it's a little bit low. Okay. I don't know uh, if I'm, am I supposed to have something else hooked up over here? Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to have a, mic a microphone hooked up or not. Okay. I don't think I have a... Mike Jack. All right. Anyway, we'll get it. Here it is, right here. I think I got it right here, Matt. Let's see if I can do this. Come right here. How about this, folks, on the fly. I know what to do. Kind of twist it up here some way. Sorry about this, folks. Let me move this over just a hair. There we go. All right. Then we got this. How about that? All right. Now we need to crank it down a little bit. Try back. Here we go. All right. It stems back to a wrong understanding of the scripture. Okay, and that's what I'm saying. You have a wrong understanding of what the water is. Well, now we heart, I am not responsible to you. I'm responsible to Jesus. I agree, and I sir. Do believe I've got the right interpretation. So, All right, now <clears throat> he says he's not responsible to Mark. He's responsible to Jesus, and he believes he has the right interpretation. Now, friends, just stop and think about that for a minute. What is it? What is it that Mr. Bowman is so confident about? I mean, if he's so confident about his, his doctrine, what he teaches, what he believes, why would he not then be responsible to Mark? I submit to you, any preacher who says he's not responsible doesn't really recognize the responsibility that the Bible puts on him. Let me show you. In James chapter 3, in verse 1, James 3 
James chapter 3. I'll get here in a minute. James says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. This is the teachers. Don't, be not many teachers. You receive the greater condemnation. For someone to say, I am not responsible to you. If you have the truth, if you have the truth, then you are responsible to tell someone the truth. If you have the gospel, you're responsible to tell them what thus saith the Lord. Now, I don't know why anyone then would listen to a preacher who says, well, I don't really have responsibility to, to tell you anything. I don't have responsibility to answer your questions. That's exactly your responsibility. Your responsibility as a preacher is to give the truth. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. He says, Take heed unto thyself and unto thy doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now here's a man knocking on Mr. Bowman's door, talking to him, having a conversation with him, and he says, I am not responsible to you. I'm responsible to Jesus. Well, Jesus tells you to take the gospel that you firmly believe you're right in and you're supposed to tell this man. You're supposed to teach him. What greater responsibility is it than to tell someone who you believe is in error what the truth is so that they can change? Now, later on, we're going to see he makes a very, a very interesting statement to Mark about why I think why he would make, make the statement that he's not responsible to, responsible to Mark, something that he believes, again, something that comes out of his heart. So when you're talking to a preacher and he says, well, I, I don't have a responsibility to answer you. Well, number one, he doesn't either, either he doesn't understand his responsibility as a preacher or a teacher, or he doesn't really care about your soul. He doesn't care about his responsibility. So, uh, Again, when you're listening carefully, you say, this, this guy, you know, he's not really concerned about me. If he was talking to you, if you're a member of the, of the First Baptist Church in Eden, and Mr. Bowman said to you, if you ask him a question, I'm not responsible to answer your questions, what would you do? Can you imagine going to the doctor, and you ask the doctor a question, and he says, well, I'm not responsible to you. I don't have any responsibility to tell you the medical advice that you're asking me. That's exactly your job. You need to quit being a doctor if, if you don't think that. You need to quit being a preacher if you don't think it's your responsibility to tell someone the truth. Now, in 1 Peter 3, in verse 15, listen to what Peter says. He says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be, re and, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, when Peter says be ready always to give an answer, he's talking about give an answer, give a defense to those that ask you. Well, if there was anybody who needed to give a defense, it would be Mr. Bowman when he's being asked about John, uh, John 3 and verse 5, about the water and the spirit, being born of the water and the spirit. He's being asked a question about salvation. And if there was anybody that needed to give an answer, it would have been him on this occasion. But instead, he says, I'm not responsible to you. Peter says, you have a responsibility to be ready always. No, not Mr. Bowman. You see, you can learn a lot by listening to what people say or maybe what they don't say. They're telling you something. It is the preacher's responsibility to help individuals who are opposing themselves. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 25, listen to what Paul says again. 2 Timothy 2 in verse 25. Now, Mr. Bowman would think this is not his responsibility. 2 Timothy 2 in verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Mark was asking for instruction. Mark, Mark was trying to get the man to give him an answer. Help me understand why, why you believe what you believe. And Mr. Bowman said, you heard him say, I know my interpretation's right. I believe my interpretation's right. Well, educate me then. Teach those that are opposing themselves. No, I'm not responsible to you. You mean to tell me someone's lost and you don't have responsibility to teach them, to instruct them, to give an answer for why you believe what you believe? <clears throat> Apparently not. Mr. Bowman doesn't believe that. I am not responsible 
to you. He says, I'm not responsible to you. Now, the next thing that we're going to listen to him, listen to what he says. We'll go on to our, uh, with our conversation. So when the eunuch was told, he, he I believed Philip preaching the gospel from my mother's womb. No, he was saying, here's water. Well see, what? well, see, I concur that baptism was always used. In fact, in the Jewish community, baptism was constantly used for any major changes that happened in the Jewish religion. Any time there were major changes in the life of the Hebrew man, baptism was used. Jesus took that concept, brought about a way to express an outward uh, expression of an inner experience. And that's what baptism So you're saying only... All right, now, Jesus... Jesus used baptism, he says, brought it over to show that baptism was an outward experience, a sign of an outward, uh, an, what, let me listen again. He didn't say outward sign of inward grace, but he says something to that effect. Religion, any time there were major changes in the life of the Hebrew man, baptism was used. Jesus took that concept, brought about a way to express an outward uh, expression of an inner experience, and that's what baptism. So you're saying only only the Jews were baptized well, in water? Well, let me just say the Jewish community used baptism as a means of conveying changes and growth in their Hebraic understandings. So Jesus picked that up and used that as a way of exp for the Christian community to express their this outward expression of an inner experience. Now I I would love to see that verse. Where it says baptism is an outward showing for an inward faith. Well, uh, that becomes an expression that I use. Oh, okay. To talk about so, baptism. so it's not scriptural. It's just something that you use. Oh, oh, I think it's scriptural because it's based. You think it's scriptural? I'm asking you for the verse. Where is the verse? Now I can show you a verse where it says baptism saves us. Well, let me tell you this. All right, now that's kind of a lengthy little segment there, but notice. Baptism is an outward sign. Any any time the Jews did something, change a life, they used the baptism, and Jesus brought that over as an outward sign of a an inward grace. He finally said, and Mark said, well, "Where's the verse? I would love to know that verse, friends. Let me tell you, if that verse was in the Bible, that baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace, every Baptist preacher and every Baptist person sitting in the pew would know it." They, it, would be, it would be ingrained in their minds uh, more firmly than John 3.16. I guarantee it. But it's not there. Now, listen. When you're listening to someone talk and you're listening to someone try to give an answer, one thing you know, one thing you can notice is when they can't give an answer, they change the subject pretty fast. They change the subject. And so here's Mark saying, show me the verse. Now, oftentimes they'll go to the same verse that we would go to to show baptism saves. Look at this. In 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 3 and verse 20, let's start there. <clears throat> which sometimes were disobedient when the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Here's the figure. The like figure, wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Now this doesn't say baptism is an outward sign. Well, it says it's a figure. It's a figure of how Noah and those individuals in the ark were saved by water. The same figure is baptism doth also now save us. Saved by water. And then he says what baptism is not. It's not the putting away the filth of the flesh. It's not just taking a bath. It's not just a, a ritual cleansing like Mr. Bowman said the Jews were always doing. What is it then? It is the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, friends, let me say Something about this answer of a good conscience. That answer of the good conscience is, it's really kind of an uh, uh, unfortunate rendering. Answer is not really a good, uh, good uh, word there. It's really a plea. It's a plea. It's an asking of a good conscience. So what is, what is it that baptism is asking? 
What is baptism a plead of? It's not pleading because your sins have been forgiven, but it is a plea for your sins to be forgiven. A good conscience that is pleading, asking for God to have your sins forgiven. See? It's not a showing. It's a telling. It's saying, look, I, you know, I need my sins forgiven, so this is what I'm doing. I'm going to be baptized so that God then will remove my sins. How is God going to remove, a sin, remove those sins? By the same power, by the same power that raised Christ from the dead. This is where God operates. It's in the waters of baptism. Let me show you. In Colossians chapter 2, Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul said, In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. When you are buried with Christ in baptism, you are operated on by God. God cuts away the sin. And he raises you up, a new creature, just like he raised up Christ from the dead, by the same power. Baptism is the pleading. It is the, the request, the, 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 the asking of a good conscience toward God. Forgive my sins. Now someone says, well, I'm going to pray to God for my sins to be forgiven. That's not what God says. If you want God to forgive your sins, obey him. He says be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, when Mark asks for the verse, where, where is the verse of baptism in the outward side of inward grace? Boy, I tell you what, it's almost like an like a, a old coon dog jumps a rabbit trail and off he goes chasing a rabbit. He done gone from, from this scent. He's over, over in the briar patch. And that's where Mr. Bowman winds up. What's the request in baptism? It's the request of a good conscience for your sins to be forgiven. God is going to take away the sins when you obey him. Now, Mr. Bowman does not, he does not have an answer. He does not have an answer. But you know what he does? Again, this is one of those things you listen for. Listen, listen for the, uh, the change of subject or listen for the deviation. Listen for the, well, let's go down this road here. When, when Mark said, where's the verse? Listen to what Mr. Bowman said. Where, where's the verse? It's where it says baptism saves us. Well, let me tell you this. I can, of course, point to several people who were never baptized. Okay. Okay, well... I can point to several people who were never baptized. So where's that verse? Well, I can tell you people who never were baptized. Well, friends, the Bible's full of people who were never baptized. We're not asking for a verse about someone who was never baptized. The question was, where's the verse for the person who was uh, uh, baptized as an outward sign of an inward grace? So when you're listening to people, listen. Notice the change of subject. Listen carefully. Oh, the thief on the cross. Boy, I wish I had a dollar for every time someone said, well, the thief on the cross, the thief on the cross. If I had a dollar every time someone said thief on the cross, I could probably build one of those buildings like they're building down there in Danville that, that Caleb was talking about. Now, what are we talking about here? The thief on the cross? Really? Is that, is that, is that your go-to? People who were not baptized? And Jesus said, uh, the thief on the cross, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Not after his resurrection. Well, let me just say, now, though, now, wait a minute. The thief on the cross, did the thief on the cross believe that Jesus raised from the dead? Jesus said to the man, today thou shalt be with did me Did the thief paradise. on the cross believe that Jesus... I don't Jesus, know what the man believed. Sir. Now, now, wait a minute. You're going to tout the thief on the cross because, according to Mr. Bowman, the thief on the cross said in Luke 23... Right? Luke 23, verse 42. He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. This is your reasoning for saying baptism, uh, somebody was saved without baptism. And then you want to turn and say, I don't know what the man believed. You mean to tell me you're going to say the man was saved and he don't really know what he believed? You're going to make a statement, this man was saved. But I don't know what he believed. 
Well, would you do that for anybody else? Would you make that statement? This person saved, but I don't really know. What kind of question is that? Or what kind of statement is that? I, I can't imagine in any scenario where I would say, yeah, that person saved, even though I don't know anything about him. I don't know what he believed. All I know is he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. But you don't know what he believed? Now, friends, the reason why, the reason why you don't know what the thief believed is because really you can't be saved like the thief. Now, you can say, well, I know some things about what the thief believed. He believed that Jesus apparently was Lord and that he was going to have a kingdom. But the, the verse that everybody runs to, the verse that everybody runs to in Romans chapter 10 and verses 9 and 10, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, this is used oftentimes as the, you know, the means of salvation. There's no baptism in that verse. Well, if you want to say the thief on the cross was saved without baptism and then run to this verse, the thief on the cross could not believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Jesus hadn't even died yet. And even his disciples, his apostles, did not fully understand that Jesus was supposed to be raised from the dead. So how did, how did the thief on the cross that, that uh, uh, knew even less about Jesus, how was he supposed to believe that? See? You see what happens when you start asking questions and you start getting people to run and you have a conversation? You start getting all the denominational you know, sugar sticks and little you know, gimmicks and gadgets and, and uh, quibbles, but you won't get the Bible. Well, the thief on the cross, but I don't know what the thief on the cross believed. But given enough time, I, I can assure you Mr. Bowman would run to John, I mean Romans 10, 9 and 10. He'd give you some examples of the thief on the cross. But here's my question. Why is the thief the only one that's ever used? Well, that's something you can ask someone. Someone says, well, what about the thief on the cross? You ought to say, well, why is the thief on the cross the only one that anybody ever uses? Why is a thief on the cross the only, the only example that someone comes up with that, well, I want to be saved by the thief on the cross? Why not the rich young ruler? Look at this. In Matthew 19 and verse 16, Matthew 19 and verse 16, here's a man that wanted to know what to do to in inherit eternal life. He came to Jesus and said, Good master, what good thing should I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is uh, none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, what? Or which? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt, commit, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And uh, thou shalt love thy uh, neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, all these things which I have kept from my youth, up, what lack I yet? Then uh, Jesus said unto him, If thou will be perfect, go and sell all thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Now, why did anybody ever say that? Why did anybody ever say, Well, I'm going to be saved like this guy? I'm going to go and sell all that I have. Now, let me tell you, friends. Let me tell you. You talk about an outward sign. You want something that everybody's going to see. You go sell all you have and give to the poor. Now that will make a splash. That, that will be a big splash. Everybody will be talking about that. I guarantee you that guy saved. He sold everything he has. But no one wants to do that. All they want, they just want to say, Lord, remember when, they come, when you come to your kingdom. Well, even that, friends, won't get, you to, won't get you saved because the Lord's kingdom's already come. The Lord's kingdom is here now. I am in the kingdom. I am a citizen of the kingdom. Paul said in Colossians 1 verse 13 that God had translated us from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians 1 verse 13. 
And people want to say, well, I want to be saved like a thief. Why don't you be saved like this guy? So when someone says, well, what about the thief on the cross? You'd ask them, well, what, about, what about everybody else? Or what about, or what about uh, Luke 7 and verse uh, 36? What about this? When one of the Pharisees desired him that he would uh, eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet, and behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of woman and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. And the Pharisees, which had bidden him, saw it. He spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. A certain creditor had two, uh, two, uh, two debtors. He goes on and tells the, uh, the parable of, of, of person being forgiven of sin. And uh, he said, you know, who forgave? And he said, the one that was, that was forgiven the most is the one who loved the most. Verse 44, and he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, seest thou this woman? I enter into thine house, thou givest me uh, no water for my feet. And she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. And thou givest me no kisses, but this woman, since the time that I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said to her, uh, Thy sins are forgiven. Now, why does anybody want to be saved like her? I just want to be saved like the thief. Why don't you go wash Jesus' feet? Why don't you go wash Jesus' feet with your tears, wipe his feet with the hairs of your head, and anoint his feet with oil? Why don't you do that to be saved? Now someone's going to say, well, James, you can't. Jesus is not here. That's exactly right. Jesus is not here, and that's the exact same reason why you can't be saved like the thief on the cross. Jesus is not here. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 9, Mark chapter 2 and verse 9, Jesus healed a man of palsy, and he said, thy sins are forgiven thee. And he was questioned about it. And he said, which is easier to say to the sick of the palsy? Thy sins be forgiven thee or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. But to know, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, uh, rise, arise, take up thy bed and go thy way and into thy house. That the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to them. Jesus had the power on earth to forgive sins. That's why he could forgive the thief on the cross of sins. That's why he could forgive the sins of the woman who washed his uh, feet <clears throat> with her tears and anointed his feet with oil. And the same reason why he could heal this man or forgive this man of sins who had palsy. Because he was still on earth. But friends, Jesus is not on earth today. He's not here today and therefore he cannot save you and forgive your sins like he did the thief on the cross. So when someone says, well, I can give you an example of people who weren't baptized. Friends, I can give you tons of examples of people who weren't baptized. But that does not mean that that is how you and I are saved today. See, friends, it's not so much as what they say, it's also what they don't say. They're not being consistent when they tell you, well, the thief on the cross. No one today can be saved like the thief on the cross. <coughs> All right, well, let's move on. Listen to what he goes on to say. Listen to what he goes on to say to Mark. Do you, uh, does it say what the man... Let me put understanding. I used to be in a Baptist church. It's obvious we don't. Peter, I'm sorry, thief. here's Jesus. Both of them still alive. Uh, listen, now, three, day, three days later, 
I'm sorry. It's obvious we don't understand. Well, sir, I'm, I'm, I'm just I, trying. I tell you what, let's do. I'm just trying. Right to now, no, I, no. But let me just say, we come from two different understandings. I used to be in a Baptist church. Well, I, I, listen, I'm not arguing your faith. You're. All right. We come from two different understandings. We come from two different understandings. Friends, do you ever realize that when people make excuses for why they don't want to reason together or they don't want to try to find agreement, that usually they wind up running smack dab into the Bible? Mr. Bowman said we come from two different understandings. Do you realize that Paul said that we ought to be of the same understanding? In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, the word that Paul used when he said, be of the same mind and of same judgment, that word, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, there be no divisions among you, but should be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. That word mind is the word understanding. Translated to understanding. So we're to be the same understanding. Now, if someone says, well, we're of two understandings, that's the whole reason why you need to have a discussion because there should only be one understanding. You can't say, well, we all get a different interpretation. We all get our own understanding. No, we don't get our own understanding. We have to understand the way God intended for us to understand it. If we're of the same mind, we'll be of the same mind as Christ. And so the point to understand each other is to come to an agreement or to have unity on what this verse means or what God is saying here or what God wants for us to do here. God revealed his mind to us. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 16 well, let's start in verse 13. Paul says, which things also we speak. The things that are revealed of the mind of God are what Paul is saying. Which man's wisdom teacheth, but which, not which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man uh, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, neither can uh, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged no man. For unto whom, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. In other words, nobody knows the mind of God where you can tell God what to think. But Paul says we have the mind of Christ. The things that Paul was revealing was the mind or the understanding of Christ. Same word right here. Same word as in 1 Corinthians 1.10. Be of the same mind. Now friends, when someone says, well, we're of two different understandings, that means you're of two different minds. You're two different minds. Two different understandings. And it is our responsibility to be in unity or have unity on these things. So when, when someone says, well, we're of two different understandings, what that tells me is I hear, I hear say, what I hear, I hear translated this way, I don't want to know what you think because I'm comfortable with what I think. I don't want to know what you believe. I'm comfortable with what I believe. All right? <clears throat> now, as they go on, let's move on here. Let's move on to a little conversation here. Judging me. I'm not judging you. You're, you're well, responsible. Jesus says it. judge this church. Well, I, I listen. Here's Jesus. Both of them still alive. Uh, listen. Now, three, day, three days later. I'm sorry. It's obvious we don't understand. Well, sir, I'm, I'm just I, trying. I tell you what, let's do. I'm just trying right to read. Right now. No, but, I, no, but let me just say, we come from two different understandings. I used to be in a Baptist church. Well, I, I listen, I'm not arguing your faith. You're okay. judging me. I'm not judging you. You're, you're well, responsible. Jesus for says it. judge righteous judgment. Uh, listen. All right, I'm not judging you, you're judging me. Now, friends, that's going to be very important when we come back in just a moment. We'll get on down the road. But anytime someone says, I'm not judging you, you're judging me, that's a lie. Just go, ahead, just go ahead and chalk it up. That's a lie. They're lying to you. Now, I don't know if you want to call them a liar to their face like that, but I'm just saying it's a lie because they're making a judgment. They are making some kind of judgment 
in order to come to the conclusion that you're judging them. See, people don't even realize what they're saying. <clears throat> Someone says, well, I'm not judging you, but you're judging me. If you tell me that I'm judging you, you just judge me. I counted up in the New Testament, <clears throat> the word judge is found 117 times. Now, friends, if we're not supposed to judge, there's a whole lot of judging going on in, first, in, in the New Testament. Now, I realize sometimes it says don't judge certain ways, but there are plenty of times where it tells us how to judge. Like John 7, 24, judge righteous judgment. But when someone tells you, well, I'm not judging you, you're judging me, that's, that's a lie. Mr. Bowman needs to do a little word study. He needs to understand what the word judge really means. The word judge means to distinguish, that is to decide mentally or judicially. Now, by implication, it means to try, to condemn, or to punish. Now, what people do today, when they see, hear the word judge, they mean, oh, you're condemning me. Well, in the broad sense, yes, but it really is the, to distinguish between something. If you determine that something is wrong, you've made a judgment. You mean to tell me, have you ever, I mean, all the people that sit on juries all across this land every day, every day, do you mean to tell me they're doing something wrong when they judge? They're making a decision. They're listening to the evidence. They're weighing the evidence. They're listening to the, 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 the defense and the, the prosecution. And they're making a judgment. Don't tell me that we're not supposed to judge. Because Paul judged. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 3. Paul said, I have judged already. Now, think about, follow this me here. I know reasoning together uh, in the in the religious world, the denominational world is not a strong suit with a lot of people. But reason with me. Paul said, I have judged already. As very as absent in body but present in spirit, I have judged already as though I were present concerning him that had done this deed. He said, I have judged already. Now, keep that in mind because in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Paul said, be ye followers or imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. If Paul made a judgment about something being right or wrong, then I can follow suit, I can follow Paul's lead, I can follow his example, and I can make a judgment about something being right or wrong. So to say, well, <clears throat> you're not supposed to judge, that's to really show your lack of understanding or really your lack of reasoning when it comes to the Bible. That's really what it's all about. Because if the Bible is what we go by, then it has to be okay to judge if something is wrong. John 7, 24, Jesus said, judge not by appearance, but judge righteous judgment. In Hebrews 5 and verse 13, we're told that the... Uh, the word is the word of righteousness. All right? The word of righteousness. The word is what tells us what is righteous and what is not righteous. It tells us what is right and wrong. So, yeah, it's okay to judge. And when someone says, well, I'm not judging you, oh, yeah, you are. And that's okay. You know what? If you want to call them and say, I'm judging you, that's fine. Judge me. But make sure it's righteous judgment. Make sure that you're judging by the word. But here's what I'm going to start doing. I'm going to start using a different term. You know how people like to use different terms to, you know, to diffuse the situation. They don't like to call it judging, so we'll just call it something different. In Acts 23, verse 26, in Acts 24, in Acts 24 and verse 21, same word, Paul says, Uh, well, got the wrong verse there. We'll go to 24. Acts 24, verse 21. Paul says, Except it be for this one voice that I cried among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. That phrase, called in question, is the same word as judge. So when someone tells, when someone says to you, 
You're judging me. Oh, I'm not judging you. No, 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 no I'm not judging you. I'm, I'm just calling into question what you're saying. I'm, I'm just calling into question what you believe. See that? So I'm trying to help you, friends. You're talking, you're talking to someone that's, oh, don't judge, don't judge. Okay, I'm, I won't judge. I'm just going to call into question. I'm going to call into question what you believe because it's not in the Bible. Show me in the Bible. I'm just calling into question that what you're doing is contrary to the Bible. Now, this is a very interesting statement here. This next statement that is made is very interesting. Notice, listen carefully what Mr. Bowman says. So John 7, 24. My, my text, my Bible says that the, the God, the Father, is the one that judges you, not, not me. So when Jesus said, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. It doesn't say judge. It says yes, it beware. Does. It doesn't say judge. Sir, them. it does. It does not. Let's well, read. say again, obviously. We're, 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 so you don't want to even look at the Scripture? Let me just say, we understand there's a different interpretation of the text. That's not, sir. Yes, sir. No. It is, yes. Look, judge not that ye be not judged. For look, verse 2, for with what judgment ye judge. So right there, he says you're going to judge. See, and the, the, the problem is the word judgment, the, what does the word judge mean to you? Well, discern, I mean, what does it say? Discern. Make a decision. Yeah, well, see, discernment is used a lot, but that's not what that word means. Okay, you tell me what it means. Judgment Here it is doing exactly what a judge does today sentences you. Now, that I would say that God only can condemn. He see, can only... See, now what I, hairs there, <coughs> no, sir. One time you judge, one time you don't. The issue is when do you use one to interpretation, when do you use another? Well, see, it's yeah. used in different uh, uh, ways. Okay, see, so, obviously, then, see, obviously you and I need to sit down at, at, at a particular I would, text. I would love to do that. And see, Now, he didn't say study, but that was the gist of it. We need to sit down and I couldn't really make out what he said, but the idea was sit down and study. And Mark said, you know what? I'd love to do that. You know what? And that's really what we're trying to do, friends. We're trying to get people to sit down and reason together. Isaiah said, Isaiah 1, verse 13. Come, let us reason together. Come, let us reason together. Can two walk together except to be agreed? Amos 3 and verse 3. We're trying to bring about the unity that Christ prayed for. And the only way we're really going to accomplish that is if we sit down together. Let's sit down. Let's sit down across the table. You know, if you want to drink a cup of coffee, that's fine. I don't drink coffee, but we can sit down across the table and let's just, let's hash it out. Why or do you believe this verse? And I'll tell you why I believe this verse. We'll let the Bible be its own best commentary and we'll come to an understanding about what God wants for us to do. If we will sit down. I mean, that's the whole point, reasoning from the scriptures. In Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, verse 1 and 2, when Paul uh, came, through, came through town, they came through Thessalonica, there was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul, as was his manner, went in unto them, and three Sabbaths they reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and then risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach to you is Christ. Opening and alleging, reasoning out of the scripture. What better way to find unity? What better way to uh, come to an understanding about what, what uh, uh, God's will for us is? But when, the, when Mr. Bowman said this, when Mr. Bowman said it, listen to what he then immediately said. Mark said, that's a good idea. It, it, Can we do that? Well, it's, uh, my thinking is that I don't, I don't believe you're teachable. What? Back the truck up a minute. Mr. Bowman tells Mark, he says, we need to sit down, but I, I don't believe you're teachable. I am. No. If you can show me the scripture. No, you're not teachable. Give, You've already made a point. <clears throat> now, did Mr. Bowman just hear what he said about judging? Not supposed to judge. Don't judge. Don't judge. Don't judge. You're not teachable. What was that if that wasn't a judgment? What was that if that wasn't a condemnation of, of Mark? You're, you're, not, you're not teachable. I can't teach you. You've already made up your mind. Well, the Apostle Paul made up his mind about Jesus. He had made up his mind to the point he was killing Christians. He, he, his mind was changed. Can you imagine Philip going down and joining himself uh, in the chariot with the eunuch. And the eunuch said in Acts chapter 8, of whom speaketh the prophet, 
this man or someone else? And he said, do you understand what you read in the, in the eunuch? He said, how can I accept, accept someone should guide me and he desired Philip that he would come with, and sit with him? And the place of the scripture where he read was he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before the shears. He so not, opened he not his mouth. And the eunuch said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet of him himself or some other man. And Philip said, well, you're not teachable. You know, thanks for the ride. You're not teachable. Can you imagine that? Friends, seriously, you can tell if someone really is concerned about your soul, if they dismiss you like that, you're not teachable. You're not teachable. With not, not, with not even sitting down. Now, there's been some folks I've sat down with. We've had discussions, and it's like it goes on and on and on, circle around, circle around, circle around, and I can tell you, there, you know, we're not making any progress. Okay, well, that's one thing. But Mr. Bowman just made a flat-out judgment. You're not teachable. Been talking to you for 14 minutes. You're not teachable. Okay, really? Really? Not to mention the fact, Mr. Bowman, not only has he judged Mark, but listen to what he said. He has already said that the Holy Spirit has to convict someone in order to make them teachable. Let's go back and grab this. In, in, uh, earlier in the conversation, here's what Mr. Bowman said. Interpret it many, many different ways. Now the question is, uh, how do we, well, I think the Holy Spirit is the actual one who brings conviction. So you and I can preach to we're blue in the face, and many times we do preach to blue in the face. The bottom line is, until the Holy Spirit brings conviction, until that conviction falls down upon people, then they're not teachable. And if they're not teachable, um, well, you, you're, you're casting your bread on the waters. Now, we talked about that uh, the last time. But again, here's Mr. Bowman. He's saying to Mark, you're not teachable. You're not teachable. But he said 10 minutes earlier, he said, well, the Holy Spirit has to convict you in order for someone to be teachable. So not only has Mr. Bowman written Mark off, he's written off the Holy Spirit being able to convict Mark. You talk about judging. You talk about some harsh judgment, some, condem uh, some condemnation right there. You're so unteachable, Mark, you're so unteachable that the Holy Spirit can't even teach you. Wow. That's pretty harsh for these non-judgmental, God loves everybody, denominational preachers like Mr. Bowman. I think Mr. Bowman must be running ahead of God, saying that the Holy Spirit couldn't even teach Mark. But you see what we're talking about, friends? When you start listening to people and you listen to what they're saying, eventually you'll be able to get what's really in their heart. They don't want to teach they don't want to talk to you. All they want you to do is take what they say at face value, send your tie, send your money, shut up and sit down and be quiet. Don't ask any questions. Don't try to learn except what I force feed you. That's what they're saying to you. And if you make any disagreements, oh, you're unteachable. You're unteachable. Now, friends, I can't imagine, I can't imagine being in a congregation Sitting in a, in a church where guys like Mr. Bowman are professing to teach you, pretending to care about you, pretending to say, we love you. And yet if you ask them a question, chalk it up to, you're unteachable. Now friends, is that really the kind of, is that really where you want to be? Is that the kind of is that the kind of environment you think you can learn with? The other day we were door knocking. Mark and I talked to a, a guy there in Eden. <clears throat> and he said, he said, I sit in these churches. He said, I just, he said, I know they're just a bunch of hypocrites. He said, I know that they're doing what they shouldn't do. He said, I know people that, that uh, they go to church and on Sunday afternoon they get out and they go drinking. He said, it's not right. He said, I feel terrible about being there. I said, you know what? You need to leave. You need to leave though, that church. You need to come and visit with us. At least examine the church that you read about in the Bible. Don't chalk us up. Don't put a blanket over everybody and lump us in with everybody else. Friends, we're not like everybody else. We're, we're, we'll give you an answer. 
We put the scriptures up in our, in our assemblies. We put the scriptures up just like we're doing right here. You got a question? We'll put it up right here. We'll, we'll answer it for you. We'll study with you. We'll come to your house and study with you. You can come to the, our buildings and study with us, and, and with us. We'll have a study with you. It, it doesn't matter. If you are sincerely and genuinely looking for the truth, we'll have a study with you. And we'll let the Bible do its talking. We'll let the Bible speak. We'll let the Bible uh, be its own best commentary. In other words, if we don't understand the verse, let's go and let's find another verse that will help us explain it. If the two verses contradict, we've made a mistake somewhere. If they harmonize, then we found the truth. And friends, that's the kind of people we are. That's the kind of people we are. We, we won't, we won't uh, be like the hypocrites who say, well, we want to sit down, but you're probably not teachable. No, we'll sit down with you, friends. Friends, you can learn a lot by listening to people, having a conversation, a denomination conversation, and that's what we did tonight. We finished that up. Friends, if we're going to assist you in any way, we want to make sure that the conversation you're having with us is not denominational in any type of way. We want to talk what the Bible talks. We'll always give you a word from the Lord. If we can help you, please reach us. Until next time, God bless and have a good night.